Mr. President, we've seen this movie before. The Senate finds itself in familiar territory. The United States narrowly avoided hitting the debt ceiling over a year ago, but now we're staring down the barrel of another debt crisis. The U.S. hit the debt limit last Thursday, according to the Secretary of Treasury, and now the Treasury is using what they refer to euphemistically as extraordinary measures in order to prevent the government from defaulting on its debts. Unless the Congress takes action in the coming months, the American economy will be confronted with an unprecedented crisis. But here's what I find strange. Despite the fact that we are hurtling toward this disaster, the White House seems completely disinterested in finding a solution. President Biden has drawn a red line. He said, we are not going to negotiate on the debt ceiling. In other words, he expects Congress to raise the debt ceiling with no conditions attached and let this reckless runaway spending and outrageous debt continue to rise. Now, I don't want to disparage drunken sailors, but it seems to me that that, that, that is the model for how the White House is responding. It's as if you or I were spending beyond our means on our credit card and then the issuer of the credit card said, you know, you're going to have to pay the money back at some point. And you say, to heck with that. I want you to raise my credit limit even higher without any demonstrated means or plan to actually pay the money back. We know what would happen for you and me is the issuer of the credit card would cancel our credit card as well it should. If, if we responded the way that the White House is responding. So what the, apparently the administration continue, plans to continue to do is continue this spending bender. It can't cover the current bills. Now it's roughly $30 trillion. And it expects somebody, anybody, maybe nobody, to pay the money back and to deal with this ever-growing national debt. We know this is even a bigger problem in inflationary times because the more money the federal government continues to spend, it is like throwing gasoline on inflation. And consumers have already experienced sky-high prices, some of the highest prices in 40 years, on everything from gasoline to food to housing, and to the essentials of life. So why in the world does it make sense for the administration to say, we're not even going to talk, we're not even going to negotiate with the House when it comes to the debt ceiling? We're just going to keep spending as much money as we can, racking up more and more debt. I, I know that President Biden has children and grandchildren, is he concerned for their welfare? We are writing checks that we're not going to have to pay back, Mr. President. You and I are at, a, at the age where this, is, this bird is not going to come home to roost in our lifetime, but it will in the lifetime of our children and grandchildren, including those of President Biden. So how responsible, or I should say how irresponsible, is it for the president to say, we're just going to keep on keeping on, and we're not even going to talk about what we need to do to deal with this mounting debt? We're not even going to entertain any reasonable ideas or suggestions about how we dig our way out of this hole. Well, the American people witnessed our Democratic colleagues' wasteful spending over the last two years and chose a new direction in the midterm elections. 
that gave Republicans the House after two years in which our Democratic colleagues spent $1.9 trillion on this so-called American Rescue Plan and then another $700 or so billion dollars on the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which, by the way, doesn't reduce inflation, but that's what it's called. In response, the voters gave Republicans the majority in the House. I can only imagine that part of that was a response to what they saw as a reckless spending binge that was going to continue without end if they maintained Democratic control of both houses and the White House. So the new reality of divided government means there's only one path we can take to avoiding a debt bomb. Republicans and Democrats have to reach a compromise. I know the presiding officer believes that part of our responsibility is to negotiate and try to come up with common ground where we can, and not simply to give the Heisman to one another and say, we're not even going to talk. I don't know why we are here as members of Congress or why you would want to be President of the United States when you would see such a big problem growing bigger by the day and say, forget it. I'm not talking. I'm not going to try to solve the problem. That's somebody else's issue. That's not ours. I don't believe that's a responsible reaction, and I don't think most members of Congress think it's a responsible reaction, but that's where we are today, but it needs to change. As we know, the reality of Republican control of the House means that the negotiation on the debt ceiling, and there has to be a negotiation, in reality has to be between the House and the White House. Nothing we do here that would get 60 votes would pass the House, I believe. I think that's pretty clear. But in order to avoid a catastrophe, a bill not only has to pass the House, it needs to get 60 votes in the Senate and the President's signature. That's, those are the facts. Now, drawing unreasonable lines in the sand and issuing ultimatums do nothing to solve the problem. Instead of doling out marching orders, the President needs to do his job and listen to what is being proposed and to negotiate a solution. Nobody I know of thinks that breaching the debt ceiling is an acceptable outcome. If that's true, and I believe it is true, then there's only one alternative, to try to work together to come up with some negotiated outcome that avoids breaching the debt ceiling, but at the same time provides some answer to those people concerned, and I'm one of them, about the ever-increasing debt and what high interest rates that are used to combat inflation are going to mean in terms of how much money we're going to have to pay to service that debt and where that will come out of things like defense spending or other priorities. President Biden served as a member of the Senate for many, many years, and he ran on the promise of continuing his same approach as a deal maker as President of the United States. In fact, he pointed to his record as President and Vice President as proof of his ability to reach across the aisle and to strike a compromise. Now, I know in some quarters compromise is a dirty word these days, but there's no other ways for us to function here because none of us is a dictator. None of us can say this is the way it is and to actually be able to accomplish what they seek. Instead, the president does have some record, a good record, in one instance, of doing exactly what he refuses to do today. As vice president, 
Joe Biden helped negotiate the 2011 Budget Control Act, which, the, which was the last substantial and meaningful attempt to rein in wasteful Washington spending. At that point, our economy was still recovering from a recession caused by the financial crisis in 2008. Federal spending soared, revenues plummeted, and it was clear that something, something had to be done to stave off an even bigger economic crisis. President Obama was in the White House, and Congress was divided. Democrats controlled the Senate, Republicans controlled the House in 2011. And as it turns out, then Vice President Biden was a key negotiator. He helped broker the agreement, working principally with then Senator McConnell, the Republican leader, to come up with a bill that passed with strong bipartisan support. So here we are a dozen years later, and we find ourselves in a similar condition without the solution. Our economy is recovering from an unprecedented pandemic. Federal spending has soared. A large part of that, Mr. President, was roughly $5 trillion that Democrats and Republicans spent together because we saw no alternative but to try to respond to the COVID crisis in a way that addressed public health needs, like coming up with a vaccine, and help sustain our economy during this crisis. But then the wheels came off the bipartisanship over the last two years, as I mentioned, with the, with the uh, ARP and the IRA, to use a couple of acronyms. But the American people have nowhere else to turn but here for us to address this problem. And now, I think it's easy to engage in the blame game, and we do it here all the time. In fact, here in Washington, D.C., it's a, it's a world-class sport. But at some point, you gotta quit pointing the finger and you gotta try to step up and roll up your sleeves and try to solve the immediate problem. I'm not suggesting we could solve all of our problems or even do it permanently, but we can address this current crisis by doing what we are paid to do, what we are elected to do, what we took an oath to do, which is to represent our constituents to the best of our ability. So this is the time for President Biden to step up. He's president of the United States, and he's done it before when he was vice president in 2011. All it would take to start this process is to invite the House, the Senate, to come sit around the table and to discuss the problem and to try to listen to what potential solutions there might be, just as he promised to do on the campaign trail. So it's time for him to do what he promised to do all along and lead. Presidents can't be a spectator. They can't sit on the sidelines. Nobody in America expects a president of the United States to do that. And the fact is, the president is not just a leader of the Democratic Party. He's the elected leader of the United States of America, all 330 plus million of us. So taking a partisan position, knowing the challenges that the House is going to have dealing with a debt ceiling, and just sort of enjoying watching them struggle to deal with this, it's not an act of courage. It's not an act of leadership. We expect our presidents to make tough decisions, just as we ourselves are expected to make tough decisions and to try to come up with solutions. I can't imagine any responsible person in the country, much less in Congress, who would take the position that a clean debt ceiling increase is the way to go. I mentioned that a moment ago. 
Who's going to pay the $30 trillion back we already owe? Is the idea that we can just continue to heap debt upon debt upon debt? Does anybody think that's a good idea? How, if we have another fiscal crisis like we had in 2008, would we be able to respond? How, if we had another pandemic, would we be able to respond with this debt? Handcuffing Congress when we need maximum flexibility to know, to be able to respond. And I mentioned the interest rates that are higher than they've been in a long time, which continue to eat up more and more tax revenue just to service that debt, to pay the bondholders on their investment. So this is not just a problem that can be punted. This, is not, this does not call for partisan responses. This calls for statesmanship. It calls for leadership. And as part of this, we have to look at what got us in this condition in the first place, why it is that we're being, that we need to raise the debt ceiling. We know that America's debt crisis didn't appear overnight. It's been building for decades. And lest anybody believe that I'm suggesting that this is strictly a democratic problem, it's really been something that both political parties have contributed to over time. Somehow we became anesthetized or desensitized to the fact that we continue to spend borrowed money. We point, and it's true, we point to the various crises we've had and we say, well, we didn't really have any other choice. But now we do have a choice. We can respond res to this responsibly and to do our jobs. Well, we need to get out of control spending habits in check. No household, no city council, no county government, no state government could possibly do what the federal government is doing. They have to live with a balanced budget. They have to live within their means. I'm not suggesting it's going to be easy, because it's not. But it's not optional. One of the most important things we can do as part of this response is to return to regular appropriations process and funding the government each year. The idea that we can do this through an omnibus appropriation process like we were forced to do last year, backing it up to December the 23rd, right before Christmas and threatening a shutdown, is not the right way to do business. The House and Senate appropriations bills, excuse me, committees have 12 separate bills to fund each of the different components of the federal government. These bills are supposed to pass both chambers and be signed into law before the end of the fiscal year, which is September the 30th. That didn't happen in 2022 or 2021. The Democratic-led Senate did not pass a single appropriation bill. Instead, and I understand why, the Majority Leader, Senator Schumer, the Speaker, Speaker Pelosi, they realized that delaying the appropriations process and not going through this regular order gave them immense power because they could decide what went into that omnibus bill. They could say yes to some and no to others. And they knew that the only alternative would be a government shutdown, and that rank-and-file members of the Senate and the House would be left with no other choice than to vote yes or no. Congress cannot continue to operate like this. We have to uh, swear off this newfound habit of continuing resolutions and last-minute omnibuses and return to a regular on-time appropriations process. It's more transparent. It allows every member of the Congress to participate, offer amendments, 
to debate and to vote, something denied rank and file members of Congress when you do this through an ominous, omnibus bill at the end of the year. But we shouldn't stop there. We need to look at broader reforms to the government's spending habits. And the good news is that there are a number of ideas that have been proposed. Last Congress, Senator Romney, the senator from Utah, introduced something he calls the Trust Act, which creates a process to save Social Security and to protect this critical lifeline for Americans. Social Security, you might recall, is going to become insolvent in the coming years. And this is a responsible way to save Social Security and to address what is roughly two-thirds, part of a two-thirds of the federal spending. In other words, about a third of it is discretionary spending. We appropriate the other two-thirds is mandatory or automatic spending. I'm a proud co-sponsor of this legislation and would encourage the President and our Democratic colleagues to consider it as part of the debt ceiling discussion. I'm also a supporter of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. As I said, Republicans and Democrats are responsible for where we are today. But it would finally make clear that we have to live under the same sort of spending limits that every family in America has to live under and every local state government has to live with, a balanced budget. Now that makes common sense. Families that are in businesses across the country have no choice but to operate on a balanced budget. My state of Texas has a balanced budget a requirement, and lo and behold, it just started the current legislative session with a $33 billion surplus. We're looking at a $30 trillion debt. My state has a $33 billion surplus, in part, I believe, because it's required by law to balance its budget each year. I've introduced, co-sponsored, and voted for about balanced budget amendments in the past, and I plan on doing so again this year. That should be part of the conversation. There are a wide range of ideas from our colleagues that would help the federal government get its financial house in order, and I would hope that the President would take these ideas and his responsibility Seriously, no matter how inconvenient this may be for President Biden, we are operating under divided government. The drunken sailor approach may have worked when Democrats controlled both houses of Congress, but it won't succeed now. It's time for the administration to sober up and get serious about bipartisan solutions. It is the only path out of this mess. Mr. President, I yield the floor, and I would note the absence of a quorum.